Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Welcome to the Scholar Online YouTube channel. In this channel, we make videos on learning web development, learning web application development, e-commerce development, digital marketing. If you're new to this channel, please feel free to subscribe. You'll find the subscribe button at the bottom of the video that you're watching right now, that red button over there. Please subscribe so that you will always be informed and you'll get notifications every time we set up a new video in this channel. We have new videos on Wednesdays and on Saturdays. Also like this video and leave me a comment below and I will try to get to each and every single comment that is made on this video. Another useful feature that we have on our videos is at the bottom inside the description box. If you expand the description of the video, you will see we've got timestamps to um, interesting sections in the videos that we're making because we, lot of, we make a lot of long videos. So you don't have to watch the entire video. You can just read through the timestamp and read about the section that you're interested in and you can just click on that timestamp and it will take you exactly to that section and you can just watch that section and it's also useful in future if you return you can just go to the timestamp and click on the section that you want to watch again and also uh, in the description below guys we've got our links to our social media channels facebook youtube twitter please follow us there as well we sometimes output information in there and you know let's start learning Welcome back to our Python Django course where we are building our own invoicing application from scratch. We've done a whole lot um, last week. If you're only joining us for the first time today, please have a look at our videos in our Scholar Online um, YouTube channel. We've got a video last week. This is lecture two of a series of lectures. So you might want to start with lecture one first to get the basics and the foundations of what we're going to be doing here today. In lecture one, we did a lot of the planning. We discussed the client journey of, of our application. We discussed the design journey and everything that we're going to be doing. We even started working on the models of the databases and we already built our you know, underlying Django application with, with just blank, with nothing on it that we're going to start building on today. And last week we already worked on the client model. So have a look at that video from last week and you can continue with us today if you've watched last week's video. What we're going to do today is we're going to try and do as much as possible, depending on the time that we have available. Of course, I always want to give you the best, um, you know, um, educational video. So I'm going to try and cover everything as much as possible. But in the interest of time, I might jump over or rush over a couple of things. But at the end of the day, you should be able to, um, you know, get our, uh, you know, uh, code that I'm going to put on GitHub and, um, you know, learn from there. So last week we did the client model, all right? And today we're going to do the product model and the invoicing model. Then after that, we will continue with our client journey. We would have now finished creating the models and we're going to do the forms and the views. We're going to do all of that today and see how far we're going to get with it, all right? So let's get right into the models, right? The models. Last week we were over here. So I've done a bit since last week and I'm going to take you through it now. So we had our invoicing um, application or our invoice application, right? This is the new app that we created inside of the invoicing uh, project and we call the invoicing application invoice. So it looks, it's, it's sort of, it's the same name, invoicing app, invoicing project, but just differentiate the two. When you're building a Django application, you always have a project directory and the project directory is where everything is kept. And inside of the project directory, you can have multiple apps, right? So our app is called invoice inside of the invoicing project, right? So our models, I've, I've typed up a bit. Last week, we discussed the client model. If you remember, we did the client name. We did the, the client address, the province, the postal code, and the phone number, text number. There's something that I added this week, which is the client logo. This wasn't there last week, but I thought as I was going through the information later on in my own private time, I thought it might be good to also be able to upload a client logo. We might not upload it inside of the invoice itself, but maybe we'll put it inside of our database so that we can differentiate the clients. We can also have maybe a client list somewhere else that we you know, deal with, uh, that we do something else with. So I just thought it might be nice to have a client logo. So head over there and add a client logo. And to add a client logo, you're just going to use a models dot image field, which is one of the standard fields that comes with the Django application. And you have to uh, specify a default and uh, an upload folder, right? 
when you specify this upload folder you can call this anything that you like i've decided to call it company logos but you can call this anything that you like and the moment you have to deal with documents and uploads you also have to specify inside of your settings.py file your media directory your media directory is the directory that django knows it must go and upload all your media to and this media is different from static because static is your static files that are that that ship with the app from the beginning your css your javascript even images that you include inside your application but they are static images those go into your static folder but if you're going to be uploading images or uploading documents, even files, even CSS, if you're going to be uploading stuff on the go, all right, it's no longer static. It's going to be dynamic in a way, but we don't, we don't call it the dynamic folder. We call it the media folder. So this is a folder that just handles all your uploads. So if you look at your project directory over there, you have your uploads folder, which is going to be handling all of your static documents and then you have your static folder which is going to be handling your um, no sorry you have your uploads that's going to be handling your uploads for a, a document which is your dynamic files that you upload as you go along and then you have your um, static folder that will handle your static files you need to tell django where these folders are so head on back to your settings.py file it will be inside of your project um, directory project directory so it will be the invoicing one and inside there, you'll find the settings.py file at the bottom of the settings.py file over here. All right. You need to, you need to make, you need to add these lines of code. All right. Uh, very, very important. Exactly the way that I have it here. Static URL is where your static folders are kept. Static files directories is the same thing as static URL, but it's different because Django uses it to find your project um, static files. All right. So you need to specify both of them. And then after that, you need to specify your static root. Okay, your static root is now where Django will, will you know, will be collecting your stuff. Every time you do collect static, it will push the static files in there. So you need to specify all three of these. And then you, this is now where the media files are kept. The media files is sort of your dynamic, your dynamic, your dynamic files and documents. This is your documents. This is when you upload an image and upload a document. If you have a file field this out of your model, all of those will go into your, into your, whatever file you specify in here. All right. And we decide to call it uploads. And then um, we have it over there called uploads. Once you call this uploads, you don't actually have to manually create a directory called uploads. Django will create that for you if you haven't created it, but you can do it if you want. But the most important thing is to specify it inside of your settings.py file like this. So once you've done that, you can go back to your models and um, your models.py file, and then you can then do something like this. So what it will do is that inside of your static, not your static, inside of your media directory where you've specified your dynamic content must be uploaded to, it will create a new folder called company logos. And why you, the reason why you want to do this is Every time you have a image field, you want to specify upload to because you might not want to upload everything into the same place. Later on, you might want to differentiate between your logos, your profile images and all of that. So even though they're all going to be kept inside of the upload folder, you might want to create subfolders in there for the different uh, models. That's why we also specify inside of the model upload to this means that inside within your media directory, it will up, it will create a new folder just for this, you know, files. And that's where you'll be able to find these files later on. So this is very, very important. I think it's also good that I included this now so that you can see how to handle dynamic upload content. Okay. So other than that, everything is exactly the way that it was last week. Then we've added some new um, models over here. We've added a model called product. And this model is the one that we're going to use to specify the products that we're adding into the invoices. So when you create an invoice for your client, maybe you're going to be able to specify the product that I'm selling here is a web development product or service. Um, so you'll give it a title, you give it a description and the quantity of the product that you're selling for the invoice. So maybe it's two websites or it's one website or it's 10 websites. So this will be a float field. We have it as a float field over there. And the price 
will be the price that you're charging for it. It's also a float field so that, um, you know, you will enter it as a number or as a number field. All right. And then uh, finally, we'll have the currency to specify which currency this is in. So are, is this in US dollars, South African rands or whatever? You know, this is just how I've chosen to do it. You can do it differently and you can define the currency maybe in a different place as a as a high level settings. Um, I think it probably, it's probably best be, better practice not to define it here and to define it in a different model where you're defining your settings for your project and you define the currency in there so that if the currency changes it's the same for all the um your your, your invoices otherwise you can do it like this here which means you could have separate invoices with separate um you know currencies in them and maybe that's what you want to do so it really depends on how you want to specify this is really up to you and then um everything else is similar you know i have the 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 string um, for the class, which specifies how to display this, the class. And I want to show the title and the unique ID. You'll see every time I'm creating a unique ID for the model when I'm saving it for the instance. Okay. So this is all the same as what we had last week. I explained it in detail last week. So have a look over there to, um, to, 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 to understand that. And then finally we have the invoice model, right? What is the invoice model? The invoice model is now the model, the underlying model. If you recall our class, I, I explained last week that we'll have the main model, which is like the master model, right? And then after the main model, you have these models, which are like related to the main master model. They actually help facilitate the master model itself. So uh, within the master model of the invoice, we want to know what is the client and what is the services they fit into the invoice model. So we've created them separately as their own models because they also have different variables because a client can have different variables that define the client can have different instances and the same as a product and services. So I call these like your um, you know, your slave models to your master model, because your master model is the one that is the main model for that application. And all these other ones support the master model with information and data. So when it comes into the invoice, we will have to have them as related fields. So in this specific case, you'll see for related field, I have related field of client and that's a foreign key and it talks to the client model class. So this client model class will be the one that's defined at the top there, which means every time that you define a, a an invoice, you'll have to specify who the client for that invoice is. All right. And it can be null if you don't have, if you don't specify a client for the invoice, because we don't want to get errors later on, but actually typically you shouldn't, you shouldn't have this being null. But um, the reason why I have it as nullable is because of the on delete, which means if in future you've deleted your a specific client, you don't want to then go and delete the invoice as well. All right. So um, when you define related uh, uh, fields, um, you have you have to define what happens when those when, when those related fields get deleted. Like in this specific case, I've chosen to use set now. You can have cascade and you can have there's many different types and you can search on um, on, on the documentation, what all the different uh, types are. But for the purposes of this tutorial, the main ones to think around is um, set now and, and, and cascade. All right. So these are two different, um, you know, variables that you can uh, give, tell Django that if the client model gets deleted, for example, what must happen to this, to this invoice? All right. In this specific case, I don't want to delete an invoice just because I've deleted the client that's related to that invoice. Because if you had chosen cascade, that's what would have happened. I want the invoice to remain. Then you can set the client as now. So it will remain so I can still can know what products are sold and the amount. And then the client will be like, you know, there's no client there. So, we, you know, because we've deleted it, you know, in the, uh, at the time and the same with the product. All right. Um, so it depends on what you're building, what you want to set this as and, and, and depending on what you're building, you'll specify it accordingly. And then, um, the main, um, uh, you know, variables for our model is the title. We want, I mean, for our invoice, we want to know the title of the invoice. We want to know the invoice number. Okay. So we're going to let this. Uh, the clients pick their own invoice numbers. Technically, you know, maybe you might want to have built this in to be, to, to be like auto increment type invoice numbers to be done automatically. 
you know, but we can let the client also choose their own universe number in, in case they want to name things differently. Like, you know, they want to have their own naming conventions. So let them choose their own invoice numbers because we still have our underlying, you know, primary key in the database. So that's not going to affect that. The invoice number is really the invoice number for the client. Even though I also have the unique ID over here, that is for a different purpose. We can still allow the client to choose their own invoice number. That's not what we have, we would have chosen as a unique ID and not the, the, the automated or auto increment primary key maybe they want to have a different naming convention for the invoice number like inv 00 x 12 it's up to them let them choose how they want to name the invoices then we'll have a due date uh payment terms this is um another a field where you can now have a um, different you know sort of like select field for payment field uh, terms you know, it's up to you how you want to do this. You could leave it blank and have uh, people do their own. But in, but you know, when it comes to this type of applications, you actually don't want to leave it blank. Um, if you recall what I explained last week, every time you have an input field that it can be standardized, where the answers are going to be pretty similar every time, you'd rather have a select drop down so that uh, people can choose. Uh, within the given fields, you know, so when it comes to payment terms, um, they are normal, they are standard payment terms that we know of, okay, 14 days, 30 days, 60 days, right, these are, these are given, so it's better for you to then specify them and have the client choose between the given standard selections, so that later on when you're analyzing your invoices, it will be easier to analyze past due invoices, things like that, you know, as, as opposed to you allowing your client to put in their own invoice terms and somebody will say, oh no, 20 days, somebody else will say 20, somebody else will, and then it will be harder to analyze things later on. So this is just good practice when it comes to building this type of applications that whenever you have an input field that can be standardized, rather use a drop down menu where you can tell the clients what those fields should be so that you can better analyze them in the future. All right. And things like the title of the invoice, well, that is very, very, you know, specific and it's very, very unique. You can't really give people a drop down to the lecture title, let them type in their own title and you probably won't be analyzing invoices based on titles. Right. So um, then, uh, but you might be analyzing invoices based on due dates. Right. And then um, the status, that's very, very important for now. I only have three statuses. But, you know, depending on your company and your organization, you might want to think around this a little bit more. You know, I have a current invoice status. You know, once you, you send an invoice, it will be current. And maybe over time, we'll analyze when it's overdue. We'll change the status to overdue. And then we'll have paid invoices when it's paid so that we know how many invoices are paid, how many is overdue, how many is current, things like that. And then the notes, this is just something useful to add. Um, you know, maybe, you, you know, the client might want to add, you know, these are our bank account details or this invoice is payable, this and that, you know, this is just like something add on to add on to the invoice itself, you know, for the client and for the, you know, so that whoever's reading the invoice can read the specific notes with respect to the invoice if they are right. But it, it, it's nullable, it's blankable, which means if, 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 if it wasn't added, it's not going to affect your model. And you'll see that um, this is my typical practice with my models. I like to have them blankable, nullable all the time because I'd rather control this on the input side, you know, um, the entry instead of controlling it on the model side because then I don't want to be um, limited by the model on the input side. So I'd rather have the model being open design and then the form is the one that's going to manage a lot of the things that are required or not required um, because I, I will be designing the form myself. And the only way to actually input information into the database will be through the form. OK, we will not be using like the admin end, for example, to input information. So, I mean, you can tell me what you think about that practice. Do you, would you rather be more restrictive in terms of your uh, of your model with the maximum lens and your nullable so that, you know, we make sure that we store things in the database the way they should be all right and and i've had practice in the past where i'm strict with the model and i'm and i get like tons of errors on the front end with small little things so then i've learned to actually just let the model be open and manage you know the controls on the on the form and on the input side then once i've done that the last one we've added this one the settings because i thought about okay but then on the invoice you normally have your client information and your own information as the person issuing the invoice where will we get that information are we going to hard code it into the um into the into the forms because we we are building like a, a form that's for one client you know but then that means that the user of the form every time needs to know how to code to go and and change that information so i thought no actually let's create a different model that's called settings 
And within this model, the settings will now um, it sort of carry or save or manage the information for the specific user that is creating the invoice. You know, so this information over here is exactly the same as what's on the client side. All right, so the client information over there is exactly the same as what we have on the setting side, except on the setting side, this will be the settings for the person sending the invoice. Okay, so this person will have, will create a settings page for them where they'll be able to specify the settings um, for them. You know, they'll be able to specify their name, their logo, their address, their province, their email, their text. And then every time they issue an invoice, we will just pick that information out of the database so that we don't have to hard code it into the invoice itself, which means, which then makes this application like, sort of like replicable, you know, like you could take the code and replicate it many times and everyone would be able to use it without having to code the HTML and the HTML would remain, you know, static without having to be changed. So everything will be uh, coded on the database side, which I think is good practice everywhere I can code information into the database side. Um, as far as a form, uh, as a website goes, even the front end stuff of website, sometimes I'll code into the database so that people that want to change the text here and there rather change it on the database and the html doesn't get touched um, except if you really want to change the design of the website but if you want to change text here and there like you want to maybe change your landing page and you had that paragraph there and you don't want that paragraph to be whatever it was and you want to change something else instead of now having to change the html code rather change it in the database and in the html just display stuff from the database you understand so that's why I have it here like this. So these are all my models. All right. Just have a look at them. I'll make this code available on GitHub. I don't always make my code available on GitHub. I get a couple of requests to do that. And I just want to let you know that I will not always do this because I think if you really watch the videos in details, you will understand what I'm, what I'm explaining. And it's part of the learning process to go and write this code yourself. And, and come back and watch the video if you get stuck because I show everything on the video, which means that if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch it and you will catch it again. And then you go and code it yourself because the learning is in developing your own code. All right. You will not learn much by copying and pasting other people's code because um, you will miss a lot of things. And in the beginning, I used to do a lot of that, going to GitHub and copying all the codes I can find. And then I'm sitting in an interview and I'm trying to explain the code and I have no idea what's there because I didn't write it, I just copied it. It works, but I don't know what the details of it is, right? So it's very, very important to write your own code so that you can understand the fact what's in the code. All right. So, um, I'm going to make this available, but this is not something I will do all the time because I chose to do it for this specific tutorial. I will do it for this tutorial. And, um, then you can go and have a look just to make sure that you don't miss anything. Okay. So, um, if you look at lecture two, which is where we are right now, we have completed, um, I've taken you through the models. Now, once you do the models updates, all right. Um, you need to go to where you are running your Django application. So it's, it's over here where you're running your Django application. But before you go there, uh, inside of your admin.py file, just register all of your models. All right. So your admin.py file is a file which sits in the same directory as your models.py file over there. And you go to the admin.py file and you say dot models import star. I like to do it that way, which means I'm importing everything inside of the models file. Otherwise, you could import them all manually and say import client products, invoice settings. It's up to you how you want to do this, right? Import star can be a bit risky. And in programming, programmers will tell you to avoid wildcards as much as possible because it opens up your app later on for vulnerabilities. But, um, because I'm doing a very simple educational purpose app, I don't mind. I'm just going to do this, but it's not good practice, right? And then once you've done that, then you're just going to say admin.site, register, whatever that model is, and um, then you can register all those models. And once you've done that, you can then save all of this and you want to test that there's no errors inside of your model files. All right. And uh, because the, you, when I do this and I'll let you know, um, because I also teach a lot of young guys how to program and develop. And, and, and I was like this when I started being afraid of errors because you think you're going to break something and you're running your code. And then it's like, you know, everything turns red and it's like error, error, error. If you run and then you get afraid, don't be afraid of errors. Errors are actually, you know, good for 
understanding what's wrong and reading through the errors so you can see the message that is being fed back to you and figuring out where the problem is and solving it okay so errors is not something to be afraid of because you are not going to break anything when you write computer code nothing is going to break so don't be afraid to experiment and write new things google stuff and if you see an error you know work through the error you know one of the my best uh, websites to go to is um, stack overflow right and i've i've learned a lot from stack overflow and when i have time i also go there to try and answer some questions and help other developers like i've been helped when i was learning how to develop myself right so don't be afraid when you get an error go over there and google it and figure it out you know it's just a normal um way of learning now once you've done all of this and you've copied that you save all of this and you go to where you're running it and you want to run make migrations. So the way you do that is python manage.py make migrations like this. All right. So make migrations, what it does is that it takes all the changes you've done inside of your models files and creates migrations for it. Right. And then you just uh, uh, click enter. So in my specific case, I've already made my migration so there's no changes i'm just showing you how to do it and then once you've done that you need to then run migrate right migrate right make migrations and migrate are two commands you have to run every time you make changes inside of your models to a py file sometimes and this has happened to me especially with bigger projects where you have like tons of applications you might have to say uh, make migrations and then add the app name. So the app name in my specific case here is invoice, right? Invoice. Because sometimes you make migrations and it doesn't pick up the app that you're trying to migrate to. Uh, you migrate to migrate and then it you get an error when you're running the app because it actually hasn't made the migrations. And I once struggled with this for like a whole two days when I didn't figure out that the migrations were not running through. So um, just read the stuff. So sometimes... Um, you might, especially when you create the, in the, the folders manually, because I like to create folders manually when I develop in my own personal computer, then push it to the server. And then when you make migration, it doesn't pick up the app. So you might have to specify, you know, make migration invoice. And then similarly, when you do migrate, you'll have to say migrate invoice like that. All right. So just see which one works. Maybe do all, do both doesn't but it usually just make migrations and migrate is usually sufficient um and you don't have to do more for the app but in case you get errors you try it like that as well so once you've made migrations you will see now that your app is done and to test that your uh, models are done properly which you don't have to do by the way but if you're a new developer and you want to see a visual representation of what you're doing as you're doing it okay you just want to run the app right run the app and then you want to go to where you're running the app and have a look at the admin dashboard. So um, this is where I'm running the app and I'm going to go to um, the admin dashboard over there. And when you go to the admin dashboard of your app, you will have to log in the first time with those super user credentials you created last week. Otherwise, you can create a new super user if you don't have the login credentials or you forgot them, which what ha happens to me all the time is I have like tons of apps I do. You forget your login credentials. You can just come over here and do python manage.py create super user. You can create a different user. Then once you have a new super user, then you can go back in there and find the login of your old super user or change the password or whatever, you know, that you've forgotten. So you can always create a new super user directly from your thing if you've forgotten your login credentials now once you get here you'll see now this is the invoice app these are all the new models i've created they are available there if you click on clients um you'll see um the client uh, app um there's actually a client already over here yeah we did this last week yeah we did this last week um but we we didn't have the model so the the, the default is this one we can always um, change this logo to a different one, uh, but maybe I'll do it later. Or actually, maybe we'll just delete this client so we can do everything from scratch, right? So maybe actually let's delete this client, right? Yeah, delete the client so that we have nothing in the database. And then the invoice, there's nothing in there. The products, there's nothing in there. 
and the settings there is nothing in there so if you see this and if you in your admin panel you don't get errors when you're trying to display the different models then everything is good to go now the next thing that i want to do is to create the form right the forms is how you're going to collect information that goes into your models so now you've already specified and defined what your models are and your models are these ones over here. So these models are data structures that's going to manage your data in the database, right? Now, how do you get this data into the database? Last week, I showed you how to do it from the admin panel. So you can go into the admin panel and you can just add a new client because admin panel is built in with forms and you can add in a new client and you can fill in the information and you can add your clients that way. And you can do the same for invoices, products. So this is pretty much already done. You can do that. But we want to do this from the application front end. So we have to basically build this form ourselves in, our, in the front end of the application so that we can input data into the database. All right. And so we're going to do model forms. And then I'll show you a little bit how to do crispy forms. But maybe let's start. Let's 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 do the model forms first. So the way model forms work is is very simple you're going to create a new file called forms.py i think this doesn't f uh, ship with the default jungle you might have to create it manually um so just create a new fold a file called forms.py once you've done that go to your forms.py all right and for every single model you're going to create a new model form all right so to do that, you're going to say at the top from Django import forms and you're going to create a class. OK, so it's going to be a class like this. You're going to say class. Then instead of the class, you're going to create whatever that model name was, whatever it was. And then it's going to be a form for that model. Then once you've done that. Once you've done that, you're going to then say forms dot model form. This is very, very important. You have a forms dot model form. This means that you're creating a form from a model. There's another way of doing this, right? Which is just a form, not a model form, which means you just create a name form, right? So if let's say you wanted to just have a form which doesn't have a model attached to it, you could just say class is a, is a form, whatever you want to call this form form and then you would say a forms.form without the model form in front of it so this one does not need a model you can just then define the different variables of the model you know like name whatever and build a form that way right but in our specific case we want model forms which is forms which are connected to a model and when you do it like that then you have to specify what that model is so we're going to create a login form and that login form is connected to the user model. Remember last week I told you when we were doing our models, we created this model, that model, that model. The user model is shipped with Django. It's a default model that comes in with Django. So you can just use it any way you want to do it. This is the model that keeps the information for your users, your username, your password, you know, your first name and the last name of your users, they are all kept inside of the user model. It's a default model that comes with Django. You don't have to build it. And um, the if, so if you go to our um, admin panel, you'll see over there you've got groups and then you've got users, right? So inside of users over there, right, you'll see this is the first user that we created when we did the create super user in the on the back end. And you can go and have a look over there and you'll see all the variables that come with the user. You have a first name and a last name, which we didn't specify. So we can actually specify that quickly, even on the admin panel. You can do that. Scroll online and you have the email address and you'll see the permissions of that user is that they are active. All right. They are a staff and they are super user. This is important for your super user to have this access because it allows them to create other super users and to do a whole lot of admin functionalities. But when you create a model, when you create a user inside of the, um, you know, like or when you create a user on the front end, they don't always have these permissions um, uh, automatically, unless if you specify them yourself, which you can. 
um, but they're not automated. But if you create them as a super user in the back end, this will be automatically added. So this user class is already defined inside of Django. We didn't build it, right? So we just actually import it from django.contrib.auth.models. We import the user class. And then once we import that user uh, model class, we can then um, decide which variables of that user class we want in the form. We just want the username and the password because we're going to log in the user and that's, that's all we specify. And then we've done the same for all the other models. All right. So we've got the client form, the product form, the invoice form, and the settings form. Okay. And you, and you'll see inside of the client form, um, for example, I'll just use this as one example for the client form. We specify the model as the client model, right? And then we specify the fields that are that we want inside of the form. And these fields are the fields that are there inside of our models file. So if you look at the client, this is client name, address, logo, province, postal, da da da. da. These are the same fields which are here. And the reason why we specify them is you can have a form without all the fields. So let's say you only want to have a form that is just for uploading the logo. Of the client so you can create that form and only include that field that you want because you just want this field to upload the logo and you can have a field that you just want to change the password then you only include the password right so the reason why we do it like this in the fields and we specify them is that we tell the form what fields to include what fields to exclude because a form just because it's a model form doesn't mean that it needs to always have in every instance all the fields of the of the of the of the um you know of the class or the model it you can choose and pick which fields you want to include inside of your form that's why we do it like that but in this specific case i actually want all the fields except there are some fields i don't want you'll see uh, back at the models there you'll see these fields over here like the utility fields I'm not specifying this field in the form. I don't want the user to tell me the unique ID or the slug or the date created and the last updated. That's why it's important to specify, you know, you, you specify which fields you want because these are utility fields, which I will actually just use in the background myself to manage this information. So the unique ID, I, 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 I define it myself the first time, you know, using the UUID form. The slug, I also define it myself. Every time the person saves that information, I recalculate the slug, right? And the, um, the date created is also created automatically. It's added here, um, you know, date created using the time zone. And the uh, last updated, every time someone changes that information. So every time the save function is called, I update the last updated. So um, these fields, you, want, you don't want them in the forms. That is why in the forms you specify what you want and you exclude what you don't want. Now, um, where were we? Over here. Now we've done the, the forms and now there's uh, there's something important that we want to do, the crispy forms. But before we get to the crispy forms, I'm going to show you um, the HTML, you know, how to load the HTML. I'm going gonna, gonna to go through this very, very quickly, right? We had the HTML files which we downloaded from... from, from um, from bootstrap and those HTML files are written in like bootstrap format or like front end format. You need to convert that into Django format. And the only thing you want to convert is the static directories and how to access the static directories, because initially they would have, uh, put it in a way that they can, you know, it's like a direct link to the static file. But when you're working inside of Django, you have to specify it differently. So what we're going to do is that we're going to create a new folder called templates inside of your root of your project. All right. Create a new folder called templates. And once you created this folder called templates, you then need to go to your settings.py file. Right. And inside of your settings.py file under templates here where it says templates, you need to specify where it must find the template directories for the templates. And then what we're going to do is just saying um, OS join um, the templates folder. All right. So it's, you're going to find the template folder inside of your base directory. And this is the templates folder we've created there so that Django knows where to find the templates. That's all you've got to do. App directories, I said true. 
So what this does is that Django will look for your templates inside of a folder called templates, which is in the base directory of your project. Now we're going to go in here in templates uh, folder, and then we're going to create different templates. It's good practice. And somebody mentioned it in one of the comments last week to um, put in the different um, uh, template folders in their own separate, uh, you know, folders inside of the templates directory. But this depends on you and how you want to do it, right? And it depends also on the purpose of the application. This, for example, is one application that has only one, um, I mean, it's one project which has only one app called Invoices. It, it's, it's not necessary to have to create another folder inside. Um, but it is good practice to do that because of the Django um, modularity. Django is built as an app that can be more, it should be modularized. And when you develop it, you must develop it with that modularization in mind, which means that everything related to, to the app must be kept in a folder for the app so that you know when you're moving it, you know, like when you modularize it so that you can be able to copy and paste different parts and sections of the app next time. So I've created this invoice um, uh, 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 app over here. I'll explain what, I, what, I'm, exp what, what I'm talking about. I've created the invoicing, I mean, the invoice app over there. And instead of templates, I have the invoice uh, templates in there. The idea behind Django modularization development is that if in future I'm developing another app that needs the invoicing functionality into it, I should be able to just come here and copy and paste this whole folder and then copy and paste that whole folder and paste it in a different app and just everything would work because all of my templates are going to be in there and all of my functionality, my models are going to be in there. You understand? And even the URLs, the way we root the URLs, that's the third part of modularization that you got to get right. Is, is that inside of the main project directory where you have your URLs, you uh, just, um, you know, direct the URLs for the invoice. So you, so instead of sh displaying all your URLs in here, you'll just sort of like say include, you will use include, which you import at the top over there, right? Include, and then you just say include that app, invoice, invoice.urls. And then inside of your URLs, you just include, um, you know, I mean, inside of your, of your invoice app, you'll include a new file called URLs, and then you'll specify the URLs in there. So when you are modularizing, when you then want to copy and paste this app, you could just take that whole folder as an invoice app and, you know, with its templates and its URLs, and then you could just paste it in a different project and everything would just work, provided you include the proper, you know, uh, includes inside of the URLs file and that you paste the invoice in the right place inside of the templates. That's the idea. But, um, so it's good practice to develop things with that in mind, even though it's just a small app, you want to develop it with that sort of thinking, um, that next time when I want to do the invoicing app, I'm not, I don't want to rewrite it. I'm just going to copy and paste from the last invoicing app I did in another project. Right. Or you can then even, you know, share this, this project as a, this invoicing app, you can just share it as a, a library and people can just download it as a library. And then, you know, everything will just work because they just have to include the URLs and they just have to include the templates and then everything will just work. And you can then copy and paste it in different projects. You understand? Now, once we're done with that, let us continue. We are now doing the templating. Yes, yes, we're doing the templating. So you've created your templates folder and inside of the template for templates folder, you're going to create a new directory called invoice. And inside of that, you're going to put all your HTMLs in there. So let's start with the main HTML with the dashboard, right? So at the top there, inside of the dashboard, I've, I've, I've then loaded. Um, you always have to include this load static. This is a requirement of Django. Everywhere you're going to be referring to the static directory, you have to load it at the top of the file. So we take our old HTML file that we had that we worked on last week, just copy and paste that file in here. And then at the top of that file, put load static. That's it. And then we're going to do load crispy form tags. Before you do this load crispy form tags, you need to go into your Django project and um, you need to do, let's clear this. 
you just need to do pip install Django crispy forms like that okay I've already installed it so I'm not gonna install it again but I will link in the description below I will link for you this URL for a Django crispy forms which explains a lot the documentation around Django crispy forms and we're gonna use crispy forms a lot because it really um it simplifies our form input and it just sort of makes things work faster instead of us manually you know like it, it will make the process faster you know django is one of those applications that if i need something done really really quickly like i get a project and i've got two weeks to do it i will use django because of all the built-in helpers that it has you know having to load to manually code forms yourself from scratch including the error displays and all of that can take you anything from a couple of days to a week, couple of weeks right but when you're working with django where you've got all of these crazy form helpers and da, da 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 and model forms you can do the same thing that you would have done in in like a week in, in a day and, and we're doing it today in a day because we, we can just use these helpers and, and crispy form is one of those nice helpers that just makes things go faster for you so let's load it like that and i'll show you the documentation and then we'll do that then once you've done that the, oh, there's only one other thing you've got to change here at the place at the top of the folder where you are talking to your css and your javascript remember we had manual hard coding of where how it's going to find the css and the javascript file right now because we're working inside of django we can't do it like that anymore so we can't say you know we can't code the direct path to your static folder and find the assets and try and code it directly like the way you would do it with a normal html because i think with a normal html you might do something like you know find the static you know static folder then you find the assets in the and then you find the, you know, CSS, I don't know, something like this is, is how you would do it in, in even your JavaScript frameworks and all of those other HTML hard coding things. But with, with Python Flask, you just, inside of, of your static folder, so you assume you're already inside of your static folder. So you start from the static folder and you root yourself to where the HTML is or the CSS is in the static folder. So if you were already in the static directory, you would just go to your assets and CSS and you would find that file in the, so you do it like that. And then, and then you just say, you know, static at the top there. So you want to do your curly braces like that. And then you're going to do your 2% signs. And then in here, you assume you're already inside of static. And if, if you're inside of static, you give it the path, the path to file, you know, inside of, static something like that if you're already sort of static how would you root to your file and then you put that inside of your href that's all we're doing here so you put that inside of to get your scss and you see and images and every stat your static images your static javascript your static fonts everything that you have to refer to inside of your static you do it that way so go ahead and do that for everything so you're going to do it at the top there for the css we're going to do it at the bottom there for the javascript and then inside of the of the of the of document everywhere you have images you're going to do it like you know do that as well so we're going to do that for our dashboard html index html and login html right so go ahead and do that you can pause it over here and manually go and do it and then we'll continue in a bit so if you've already done that we can then test out our HTML, all right? But before we can test it, we need to render this HTML from inside of the view function, okay? So in order to do that, um, it, it's in two steps, all right? So let me actually add a new, a new slide in here so I can explain to you what we're doing here, right? But if you... If you're going to get confused as well, have a look at our previous um, Django tutorial where we do this in detail because I'm really going to go over this very, very quickly because I want to finish everything in this one tutorial. So you have your models, right? You have your, your forms. You have your views. 
and then you have your HTML. Right. We've done the models. We started with that because that's the planning. That's the structure of your application. We've done the forms using the model forms. You'll see, you've seen how quickly it was for us to build the forms uh, from the model forms. Once you do that, we actually went straight to the HTML before we went to the views because there's something between the views and the HTMLs. And I'm going to use instead a line to, to show you that. And this what is between the views and the HTML is what we call the URLs. Okay, so I can't display that over there. Let's just delete that and put this over there. And then uh, let's try and do it like that. Oh, no, it's going to be a problem. Let's just put a text. Let's call this the URLs, right? The URLs is what um, sort of Actually, yeah, the URLs come a bit in front of the views because they define what views Django shows when somebody is looking for a specific routing. So this is the like the URLs, the routing of your application. All right. So we built the HTML files. Now we're going to work on building the views and the routing for the applications. Right. Now, our views inside of your project. Inside of your app directory, invoice, you have a new, you want to create a file there called views.py. I think this actually ships with Django by default. If it's not there, you can just create it, but you must call it views.py. Once you've created that file called views.py, this is where we are going to um, render our HTML um, you know, with the data from our models and our forms. So this, is, this connects the models and the forms. The models and the forms, the views, talks to the models, the views, talk to the forms and get all of that in some Python, you know, you know, uh, whatever Python code and, you know, does some, you know, computing in there. And this way you're going to do a lot of your logic computing and your, you know, whatever, a lot of the analysis you're going to do it in there. And then the view decides, you know, what to render on the HTML. So inside of our view file, there's a lot here and I'm going to take you through slowly, right? So don't get confused. Let's look at the simplest view, which is this one, right? Index, the index view. This is the view that we're going to show when you want to display the index HTML file, which is like the home file for our app. So when somebody goes to our app, we want, we want to take them to the home file, which is like the landing page. So let's call it, we want to display the landing page for the application. We're going to call it index. All right. And, um, and then we're going to create a variable called context. This variable is useful for pushing variables to the HTML file. When we're rendering our HTML file, that is that, that we've got variables we want to render in the HTML file. We're going to use the context to push those variables to the HTML. So if, for example, you want to render somebody's name, surname, and this is dynamic information that you're getting from the database, you will call the database and then you will enter those variables in the context and then you will push them um, using the context into the HTML when you're rendering it. So when you render the HTML, you've got the request, which comes with the you know, request over there. And um, then you, the, the name of the HTML file that you want to render. And in this specific case, it's inside of the invoice directory. So if you look at our templates, it's inside of the invoice directory and you want to render index.html. You don't have to say templates here. You don't have to say templates like that because you've already defined in your settings file that you want to go into the templates directory. So once you're inside the templates directory, then you just root the HTML, uh, where the HTML location is inside of the templates directory. Then once you've done that, then you show the context. This is the simplest way to root an HTML file. We don't have any variables. We're not calling, um, the database. We're not doing anything. So let's quickly just save all of this and then run this. All right. So I'm working with Git. So it's going to take me a while to always push everything up here. Um, I will add stuff. Git, git commit, add stuff, all 
right right and then we're gonna run this right so we're running this now i'm gonna go to the home um to display the you know the home page right and um this is now displaying my index.html which is this index.html file all right um i'm going ahead of myself because i've shown you how to do the 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 the, the view uh function but i haven't shown you how to do the urls and the routing okay so to do the urls and the routing you have to so when you do it the first time if you haven't done the urls and the routings you're gonna get an error here because you haven't told a Django how to root this html of course you've built the view but you also have to do the routing on top of it so to do the routing, you start with the a project urls.py file, which is a urls file, which is in the same directory as your settings.py file. So this is the project directory. You go into the urls file, and you remember I mentioned earlier on the whole modularization thing. Um, so inside of, of over here, I've, I've created a, um, an include for the invoice app. So what I do is I say path invoice um, slash include invoice.urls what it will do is that um it will go inside of an app if we have an app called invoice and if in a file called urls and it will add all those urls in here and append them to invoice minus i mean invoice dash which means all our routes inside of there will be invoice dash right and then i've created a new path over here that says um invoice views um, index, uh, this is the index path, and then this is the empty index path, which means if you go, uh, there's nothing in there. Um, I just want you to display, um, you know, invoice views dot index. This is actually a hack because ideally what you want is you, you might just have maybe one landing page in here and create the view function in there, but I didn't want to create the view function in there. I have all my view functions inside of the app. So, um, that's why I'm importing it at the top over there invoice views so from invoice import views as invoice views i'm importing this from the invoice app again so i'm including the invoice app and then i'm importing from the invoice app it's a bit of a workaround because i i want this path to be that i don't want it to be i don't want the index to be invoice index all right i just want it to be like a blank path without this because the moment you do includes every other path after that will include that invoice minus and i didn't uh, invoice a slash and i didn't want that i just wanted it to be the main you know like the whole i mean like without any slashes next to it and um for that i had to just import um the views at the top there and um you know uh, invoice dot index which is this now the index path which is this one over there and then display the index or html so that's what this this is doing there and then but the rest of the paths can be under the invoice slash so i'm going to use the include and then i will include the rest of the parts inside of the invoice invoice to urls so invoice to urls i will do that which means i can actually delete this index over here because now i'll have two indexes so I'll, I'll delete that and then i'll do the login and the dashboard over here another thing you want to do is you might want to have your own app a different app for authentication but because we're building such a small uh, project i'm not going to do it i'm going to put everything inside of the of the other of, of the invoice app so once you've done that now your routing is is done so inside of your um of your urls you've got your your first routing this is the routing that routes to the index page and then this will route all the way to the invoice um urls.py file which is what's in here so all my other routes i'll build them in there all right so um the login page which is that one over there if you look at the views for the login page this is the view for the login page it processes the login form okay i'll spend some more time in detail explaining this and then the uh the, the dashboard once you finish logging in it sends you to the dashboard and then you will see the dashboard right so these are all the views these are all the urls and over there and over there let us save this again and then let us test our login uh, uh, path, which I will explain later how it works. But let's test it first.
right so we're gonna refresh that good so i've rooted this button to take me to the login page okay let's press it okay i'm already logged in so um that's another thing okay i'm showing you a lot of things and i'm showing you very very quickly but there's something else i've done so and this is good practice for building a login page is that if the person is already logged in all right if a person is already logged in um, you don't want them to go and log in again and go to the login page. So what I've done on the login page, I've added a decorator called um, anonymous required, which means the person must be logged out to access that page, which is the opposite of login required. You might know login required. So this, uh, this is what we call path decorators. I think I must explain this first because we won't be able to do the next thing until you uh, understand the path decorators. So this is path decorators on from 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 Django and you can uh, if you want to read more about path decorators you could just do a search google uh, Django um path decorators all right and um and view decorators and go to the Django documentation specifically you will see that there's a lot of um you know decorators that that you can get there's a lot i mean it depends on what exactly you're trying to do but what decorators do is that they protect routes from being accessed by the wrong people or they also help you manage access permissions inside of your Django application so if you created a route for example an edit page route and you want the only person that should be able to access this route is an owner of this document right you're going to do it inside of a decorator uh, so to to manage the access but one of the most important routes uh, uh, accesses that I'm going to teach you today is the login required decorator and the anonymous required. These are the most common ones you will use all the time, but you can get really complex with decorators and you can build standard decorators and whatever. And I, what I'll show you today will cover you being able to build your own standard decorators in future. Okay. So if you go to, um, 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 let's go back to our Django views. If you go to, um, and, and you can download the login required decorator directly. You don't have to build it. It's already part of uh, the Django documentation. So you can go to Django Contrib Auth Decorators, import login required. What this decorator does is that you can then put this login required in front of any route that you only want people that access this route to be logged in. And this is very, very important for this type of app. You don't want someone to access your dashboard for example, this dashboard, you don't want someone to be able to come here and they are not logged in and be and see all your invoices because you're managing login control. So this just looks at that the person is logged in before they access this route. OK, so you're going to put this decorator in front of all the routes that require access from a login perspective. And you import it there and we go to our dashboard, you'll see I've put the I've put it there login required right which means if you're not logged in you will not be able to access this route it will kick you out and it will kick you to um, the login page so automatically if login if you use login required it will kick you to the login page if you're not logged in and you don't even have to write that logic yourself it's written in the back end of Django. so i tell you the Django is an amazing app for all of this hard coding and boiler plating you would have had to do manually if you're doing using something like flask for example then the next one is anonymous required. Now anonymous required doesn't quite come shipped in. I, I had to do some tinkering to, um, to, to, to write this route, but I'll explain to you what I've done here and the tinkering I've done here. You can then uh, use yourself, edit it to, 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 to create different types of access, like ownership permissions and things like that, because it works off the user, um, user passes test. All right. So you can, um, you can, um, from the same location where you um, imported your login required, you can log, you can import user passes test, all right? User passes test is a very, very useful um, decorator that you can use to create a certain test, right? So now we're using a test of testing that the user is actually um, logged out, but you can create a user for permissions that the user has a permission to do something or that a user has, you know, a, a user is a staff member, for example, or a user has got super user rights, you know, so depending on all the things you might want to, to have permission for the user, you can use user passes test. And the way it works, so I've decided to call mine anonymous required, all right? 
And then um, if you don't have a redirect URL, you can redirect to the dashboard. All right. So I'm assuming by the time you are importing this um, anonymous, actually, no. You should actually, uh, for the user passes test, you actually want to send them to the index, not the dashboard. I copied and pasted this from somewhere else where I was doing some other uh, user pass, user test, which the person would have been logged in by the time they are going through this test. But in this specific case, maybe the user, the person is not logged in um, or the person is logged in. Actually, yeah, sorry, sorry. Dashboard is correct. Because this is where um, if the user fails that test, they must go to. And they'll go to the dashboard if they fail that test, but they would only fail this test if they are logged in and they are not anonymous, which means that then they should be able to access the dashboard. So this was correct, okay? So then actual decorator, we're using the user passes test, all right, which is the one we are uploading at the top over there, we are uh, loading. And then we are asking the question using a Lambda function, if the user is anonymous, Right, and user is anonymous is a built-in function inside of Django, um, which you can uh, call on a user. Right, so for example, if you had a user, let's say you had a user is equals to user objects, get username, username is equals to whatever your username, email dot address dot com, email at address dot com. Let's say you had a username with this address and you could get this user object, right? You can call from this user object, user dot is anonymous, right? And it would give you a Boolean of true or true or false. So when you have a user object, you can call it anonymous on user and it will give you a, a, a result whether they are anonymous or not. And, and by anonymous, it means if they are logged in. I mean, no, 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 if they have a profile, yeah, if they are logged in. So it's the opposite of is logged in, is anonymous, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a Lambda user is anonymous, right? And if if they pass the test, if they don't pass the test, you're going to send them back to the login URL and the login URL is the redirect URL, right? The redirect URL is the one that you've put at the top over there and it's a dashboard. And, um, and then it's a function and then you return that decorator and, and, and that's it. It's a bit of two or six lines of code that's actually doing something very, very simple. It's just asking the question, are you anonymous? And if you're anonymous, if you pass the test and you are true, you are anonymous, then you can proceed and access the route. But if you fail the test and you are not anonymous, which means you are logged in, then it will take you to this redirect URL that you've specified the dashboard. So that's why when I have that login required, for dashboard, I'll pass that login required test. But when I, but inside of my login route, I have anonymous required. If I'm logged in, I will fail that anonymous required test, and it will take me to the dashboard anyway. This is why, if I currently, if I try to access the login route, let me see if this my app is running. I'm currently logged in. If I try to access the login route as logged in as I am, okay. Um, sorry, it's not the logged. In, this is not the login route. Let's go home first. Um, there's the login route. Okay, so it's invoice login because it's 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 built inside the other one. So if I try to access the login route, um, it takes me to the dashboard because I can't actually access the login route if I'm logged in. But if I go over there and I log out because I haven't built in a logout in there, but I can log out from the admin panel because it will log me out through the whole Django app. It's the same application. So if I'm logged out like I'm logged out there and I come back here and I try to refresh this. All right. I'm trying to review this page. Remember I should pass the test of I'm logged in to be able to access this page. So let's see. All right. Then it takes me to the login page, but because I haven't defined the login, it's, it's, it's trying to take me to the login page, but um, I, I haven't defined it properly in the, in the thing. So it's, 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 it's taking me to accounts login. And, um, and then there's no accounts login in the URL, so that's the problem. So what I need to do is that I need to, to define inside of the settings.py file, I need to define what they call a login redirect URL. But I need to find the correct way of, of writing this. There it is. You need to specify your login redirect URL. This is the uh, uh, URL that your user will be redirected to every time they finish logging in. 
and your login URL is the the URL that Django knows to be your login URL. So every time somebody is not logged in, it knows where to where to send them to. And this login and dashboard must match URL paths which you have in your URLs file. So if you look at your URLs file, in my case, urls.py, I should have a, a path called login and a path called dashboard. And this login path is the one which is going to be then sent to when somebody needs to log in. And the dashboard, when somebody has logged in and they are being redirected, it will send them there. All right. So you must specify them in the URLs file and then you must put it in the settings just like that. Then this should work. All right. So we want to test that if I'm on the dashboard and I'm logged out, I can't access the dashboard. All right. So currently I'm still logged in. I'm going to log out again. I'm going to do what I was doing before. Now I'm logged out and you can see this was still, I was still on the dashboard on this side. Right. So let's now. Uh, refresh this page and it should log me out because when I refresh this page, it should uh, rerun this route. And when it, it tries to go to the dashboard again, um, which is over here, it will come across that login required. And if I'm not required logged in, it should take me to the login page, right? So let's refresh that. And it takes me to the login page. Now our login page looks ugly. And typically this is what happens the first time when you're trying to work with Django forms if you haven't styled them properly. So I'm going to teach you a, a couple of tricks, right? The first one is the, um, using the, um, the, the, the crispy forms, right? So we've installed the crispy forms, but the crispy forms don't always work because they're limited, right? So I've installed the crispy forms and let's go back to our forms. And if we look at our forms, um, dot py file, this is our login. A user login form it's this one over here and it just takes in the username and the password so it takes in the username and the password like that right and then after taking in the username and the password um it goes into the view function all right and the login view what it does is that there's a get and a post request for the login view so the the get request it just takes in that form and it sends that form to the context which is why we have the context there. So it sends the form to the context and that's all it does for the get uh, review. And for the post view, it displays the same form, but it's a request.post, all right? So it feeds in the request.form into the form. And then we, we get the username and the password, and then we log in the, the user. And if the user is not none, we log them in. If they, they are none, we just say credentials are not valid, all right? We just like feedback using the messages that you're Credentials are not valid. We can't log you in and we send them back to the login page. We redirect them there. But if they're logged in, we return them to the dashboard. So that's all we're doing for the login form. Okay. This is a very simplistic way of managing the login. It's not the Django way, but it's a way you, I think you most probably, you know, understand easiest. Okay. So get post process the form. If they, you can authenticate them, send them to the dashboard. If you can't, send them to the login page and then we've got our messages all right messages you need to import messages at the top if you want to use messages from Django contrib you need to import messages and then you need to display these messages on the front end as well so inside of the html file of our login page we display the messages over there all right this is a very fancy way of displaying messages, but basically what it's doing is that it's say, asking if messages are there for all the messages, just showing an alert. If the message is an error message, show an alert danger. If it's not an error message, show the other alert message tags. The reason why we do this is because it has message.error, not message.danger that Django feeds back. But basically what this is doing is that whatever the message is available, it will display it. And, and you have to paste it on all the pages you want the messages to display. So I've got it on the login page for now. I'm only going to do it for the login page. Once you know how to do it for the login page, you can do it on all, all the other pages where you want the messages to display. And so displaying the messages, displaying the form, that's what the login page looks like, right? And inside of the HTML, let's go into the HTML, login.html. Um, very, very important. You need to show the CSRF token. Um, I had forgotten it, but you need to have it. And then you um, then have the messages, all right, that are going to be displayed. And then we just sort of like form username as crispy field, right? So I'm actually already doing it as a crispy field, but I don't like, I don't like this, all right? This is already a crispy field and it doesn't look nice. So crispy field don't always work. 
right? So what I did is that I went back to the old HTML of this page to see what it was like there, because I want to display it like it was in the old HTML. So you can input and manually input CSS classes into the forms so you can style it the way it was styled originally. It takes more effort and more time, but if you don't want a form that looks like this, you might have to do that, right? So to get around that is um, you go, I went back to my old HTML. Um, let me find my old HTML file. Where is it? This, right? I think it's this one login this is what was there before okay so i'm just gonna copy this right so if you copy that i want to display it exactly like this because that's how i'm going to get it to show the way i want it so um we're going to go over there and go into our forms and, and on top of our user login form i'm just going to paste this like that so it's a type email it's a form control and um it's got an id and i think this id is important because it looks like they've styled it into the id you know the the, the styling and um the placeholder so what i'm gonna do is that you can specify inside of your forms even though you've got model forms right you can still specify details like widgets so you can use a jungle widgets to specify this all right so you can still say username right is equals to and then displayed as a widget and i've got it at the bottom there because i don't want to think too much so i'm going to copy that and i'm going to paste that in there remove that make sure that the uh, indent is correct paste it again all right so i'm using a forms character field and then i'm i'm, I'm specifying my widget and inside of the widget i'm specifying a text input and then I can then add that ID. You see that floating input ID? There it is. I can add it over there. And then I can add also the class form control. And then I can even add like a margin bottle, which is going to like create some space between this field and the next field. So that I have a little bit of space of a margin bottle. So when, when you use a, a text input, you have the function, the, the, the widget, you have more flexibility to specify more CSS classes. So you can style your form a little bit more. So that your form is going to look a little bit better. All right. So I'm going to do the same thing over here. Okay. Let's just copy that. All right. Username and password. And then uh, paste the password over there. And then the password is a password input because you also don't want people to put in a password and it looks like that, right? Because then people will see the password, right? You want it to be like a password input. So um, that's how you do it inside of the widget. And um, and then you space, you do it like that. And I also form control. And then I can put in the ID, which was a floating password, the ID for the other one. And I think they've built in the styling into the ID of the field for some reason, which is not good practice, by the way. And, um, and then, um, you know, margin bottom. And then let's try, let's try this. All right. Let's try this. I think it will, the form will look much, much better. Right. Okay. So my, my server has restarted. And then I'm going to just refresh this page. That looks much, much better, doesn't it? All right. So you've got to username and password. But it's still. Still, I don't, I still don't. Um, crispy field. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Let's remove that crispy field. Yeah, the crispy field is, is the one that's messing this one up. All right, so let's get rid of it so that we just have it like that. Because we've already now styled it, we don't need a crispy field anymore. Crispy field helps just with the styling, so you don't have to do it manually, especially if everything is just going to be form control and you can use the bootstrap crispy field, then it's um, you don't need to do anything else. But if you've decided to style it manually yourself, then you actually don't need the crispy field anymore. All right, so let's get rid of it. Filter. All 
what I'm doing over here is just pushing my changes to my uh, virtual server because I'm running my code of the virtual server. You don't have to do it like this yourself every time. Um, you can just do this manually from wherever you're coding from. Um, so let's refresh this. That's much better. You see? Now, from what we had before to what we have here, this is how you would be you would be able to style your forms if you wanted to do this. But the problem with this is that you'd have to do it for all the forms. And let's hope that with the other forms, I won't have to do it because it's a bit of a tedious uh, process. But now we can log in here now, right? We can now log in. And I didn't create a register route. I'm not going to because um, I'm building this uh, invoice application for in-house um, in-house you know, invoicing, it's not going to have multi users and multi, you know, uh, it will be one company with one setting that can create multiple clients and multiple products and services, which means that um, the whole purpose of this app does not require for there to be a registration screen. I don't want people to be able to register for this app and see my company information. I want people to log in and I will create them a login myself um, some way uh, and you can do it in the back end over here. You can go and create a user from the back end. And then, then users can log in without them creating accounts. We don't want that. All right. And then we can um, log in over there. So if that's correct, my password, it is correct. And then it, once you log in, it takes you to the dashboard. All right. And you'll see that um, um, the home route doesn't have, like if you go to the home route, it doesn't have a decorator. So my index route, which is this one over there, the index root it doesn't have a decorator on it which means you can you can access it whether you're logged in you're not logged in anybody can access the root it's open it's an open root right but now that i'm logged in if i want to go to the login page again but i'm already logged in you don't want people to go to the login page if they're already logged in so that's why on the login page i have anonymous required let's see that anonymous required work requires work if i click that login button it takes me straight to the dashboard doesn't take me to the to the to the to the login page anymore it actually takes me to the login page and when it gets here it meets that decorator and it tests that thing and it, it realizes you pass that test you're not anonymous and then i mean you failed the test for being anonymous so it uh, redirects you to the dashboard so that's what happens there all right and the logout button i haven't uh, cleared that yet but it's easy to 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 to, to um to do the login route to the to do the logout route actually we can yeah we'll do that a bit later on in the end so what we have here now, we are in the dashboard, right? We want to be able to, um, I'm going to just do this for one, okay? For the client, okay? So I'm going to I'm gonna pipe the client route where you can click the client uh, path and then you're going to see a, a list of all your clients, all right, in a, in a table. And if you don't have any clients, you'll be able to see like a button at the top that says add a new client. And then you can do a form to add a new client and then they will appear on the table and you can add multiple clients. And then um, you, you'll be able to do the same for the products and services. And once you know how to do it for the clients and products and services, you should be able to do it for the invoices. So I'm going to show you once how to do it for the clients, all right, in this tutorial. And um, we are running a bit out of, out of time, so I'm going to do it off camera. And then when we come back, I'll just show you what I've done um, to save time. Okay, for the last part of our lecture today, and I think our lecture is getting a little bit too long. So this will be the last part, I promise. Um, we have done a couple of things. We, this is where we left off with you. We had this dashboard and it's got just random data. We're going to change this later on. Our dashboard is going to look much, much nicer than this. It will show, you know, our stats and everything that you would typically want to see in a dashboard for invoicing. But, um, what I, what I, what I said I was going to do was that I was going to create a client products and invoices, HTML pages to show you how to add these different things into the database. Cause you have to add the data first before you can look at it in the dashboard. So our first page that we're going to work on is this client page. You see now currently there's nothing there and I've just displayed a blank sort of like blank image, you know, to sh in the space where there's nothing to be displayed. And hopefully you're going to be able to click this button, add a, an invoice, and then the invoices, I mean, add a client and the clients will, will, will appear here in a list format like that. So this is adding a client. And if you want to get these um, images, I got them for free from Android.co. Okay, it's open source. 
um, you know, SVG that you can use for your uh, products, for your applications, you know. So I promise for this tutorial, I'm going to use only open source um, items so that I can share with this with you on, on GitHub. So you can go over there and you and find images. So the one that I used over there is this one, Edpost. And all of these you can use for free on your website. And so that's the one that I, I used over there. And I'll show you now quickly how I'm doing this. In the back end, I've done a couple of things since the last time. Let me close all of this and take you through systematically, step by step, how to get to where I am now, to where we were before. So where we were before, where we closed off at the end, we had our invoice application and we had our views, right? And we had only the views for dashboard. So this is where we had. So I've, I've gone and I've entered a view for invoices, a view for products, and a view for clients. Okay, so I've added three new views which will handle the views for clients, products, and invoices. We didn't have these views. And these views need their own HTML pages for invoices, products, and clients. So you'll see this one is going to dashboard. This one we had already. So I had to create a new HTML for invoices, a new HTML for products, and a new HTML for clients. So if you go to your um, templates under invoice, I did them all in the same invoice application. I created an invoice for products, an invoice for, I mean, an HTML for products, an HTML for invoices and an HTML for clients. So I added three new HTML files. And if you look at this HTML file, the one for clients, it's going to look very similar to the one for dashboard. In fact, it's exactly the same HTML, except for the fact that we're going to replace this content in the middle with the new content and every time. So the rest of the uh, uh, HTML should be exactly the same. And this is where I'm going to introduce you to the new Django concept of, because it's not a new Django concept, but it's a concept I'm introducing in this lecture uh, that is called template extensions. Okay. Where well, you can extend a template so you don't have to retype everything. Because if you look at these templates, it's, it's pretty similar. All of these, you would have to retype it. But the only thing that's different is what's inside here. The same for clients and product services invoices so instead of retyping your html we're going to create one base html that we're going to call a base html which will have this stuff that is exactly the same and then we will just retype what goes here so i went and i created a new folder inside of my template and i called it partials and inside of partials i created a new for a file called base.html and i basically copy and pasted the entire html for this all right so i pasted all of it in here and then I looked at it and I said, which is the part that's going to be replicated? So the part that's going to be replicated is basically in here. And it's, it's what was inside of the main of the, of the document. So when we go to that main over there, I just cut it from this uh, folder. I mean, from this file and I, and I replace it with a block called block main and block. Then I'm going to take it and, and go back to my HTML file for a uh, dashboard. And I'm just going to recreate that main and paste everything in there. So now what's inside of the dashboard.html is just this section of the table, just this table over there. And then it extends. And then at the top, you're going to add extend partial space and then load static and crispy forms as usual. So this is the normal loading. And this is, this must come at the top of the file to, ex to, to tell you that you need to extend partial space HTML which is this partial space HTML, we are extending it over there. And then after we extend it, then everything else is exactly the same. So what this does is that it goes and it, you know, you have one, one base file, and then we, we will then with the new files that we recreate, we are just going to type only this main section, you know? So when we, then we did the same thing for our products or HTML, we just extend uh, partials. And then the main block you'll see is just this little part, which is the, the two bar at the top. And you know, the table, we haven't done anything for this template. It's just a little bit empty for now. And we do the same for clients. And, and basically that's what we, that's, that, that's the helpful part about template extension that allows you to create one base template which you define a lot of the repetitive stuff so you don't have to retype it and nice thing about it as well is that then when you want to change something for example on the 
you know dashboard when you want to increase the menu now you want to add something new to the menu you don't have to go find all the templates that have the menu in it you just go to your base template and you change it once so it has a double benefit in the sense that you can then you have one place to change things and then um you know you don't have to retype your code every time and it's good practice generally um in programming if you have um, a piece of code that is duplicated, you want to then write it in one place and refer to it as opposed to retyping it many times because you don't want to then forget the next time you want to retype it and you don't want to do too much work and too much repetition. It's just good coding practice. So once we've done that, um, so that's the first thing that we did, which is template extension. All right. So um, that's done. Then we go to our... Um, our, our, we're going to first work off the clients, all right? So this client's uh, HTML file over here. So you'll see, instead of displaying the table, we don't want to display an empty table to the client. You know, I mean, we don't want to display an empty table to people. It's not a nice thing to do. So instead of displaying an empty table, we're going to display an image, all right? So we're doing what we call conditional displays in Django, where depending on, on, on a certain condition, you're going to display a different thing. So the condition that we're using here is that the condition that if this list is empty, display for me this image that says add a first client. But if the list is not empty, then you can display the table. So we've got a conditional display here, which I'll get to later. Because before we even discuss the list that we're displaying, we need to get that list first to the template. So if we look at our view function, all right, our view function over there, all right, so what we do is that we get the client list from the database, okay? And the client list will be the client class, which we're importing at the top over there, models, which we import from the models.py. So it's this client model. So you can copy it over there and make sure that inside of your views, you import it over at the top for models import. And then once you import that, then you can refer to it over there and say client objects all. What this does is that it goes to your database and it just fetches all the client objects, all of them. Then we're going to send it over to the front end. Context clients, clients. We're just sending this list to the front end context so that we can refer to it in the HTML. So once we've done that, all right, let's um, go to the HTML for clients, which is this one over there. All right. And then we're going to start with our conditional uh, display. We are saying if that clients, which we now we've sent from the back end, if the length is greater than zero, you can display the table. So this conditional um, um curly braces, what it's doing is that it's just asking a question. If you meet this condition, yes, you can display everything. So everything inside of these braces from the beginning of the if to the end statement, every time you have an if statement inside of a Django template, you have to close it with an end statement, right? So I'll show you where the end is, where we end this, but we started like this, and then we're going to display this table inside of the if condition. So we are saying that if this condition is true, and the length of this client list is greater than zero, right? We're going to display this table, which is the client name, the client email address, the phone number, the address, the province. So if you go back to your models, you can see all the variables you have in your models. And then um, we, for every row of that table, we have a table row. For every table row, you're going to have a client.name, client.email address, client.phone number, and this must match that. Client address must match that, province must match that. And then you and then you're gonna iterate this for client in clients. So it's iterating through the client list inside of your length of your of your list. And for as many clients as you have, it will create a new row. So you'll have a new row per client. So if you have one client, you'll have one row. If you have two clients, you'll have two rows in your database. And the more clients you have, the more the rows you will have over here. Okay, so for client and clients, you're gonna display all these rows and you're going to display the information. So all over here, you'll have a table that displays all your clients. And in case this length is not greater than zero, so if there's no nothing in the database, then it will display this image. And I'm going to call this my empty state image. All right. So display the empty image. If there's nothing there, if there's something there, display the list. Then inside of the view function, you're going to continue. You're going to create your client form. This client form is the one that we have inside of our forms. Is that form we did before the client form? Remember, we just did it's a model form, and we just do the meta and we pick all the variables we want to be displayed in the form. That's the client form. It's exactly the same thing we did with the user login form. 
except we're not manually doing the variables for now. We'll see what the form looks like. And then the context form form, we just push it to the front end. It's the same thing we're doing there. We put, every time you need a variable in the front end, you need to push it via the context. And then uh, if the request is post, which means they post the form, you're going to go into the client form and then you're going to do request of post. In this case, don't forget request.files because request.files is for images and um, a media objects. In this case, our form does have an image. Our client form, if you recall, um, where's our forms? It does have an, a client logo, which is a, an image field. So for an image field, you need to make sure that you have request.files or else it won't pick up the image. Then um, if the form is valid, save the form. This is all you're doing in Django. If the form is valid, save it. What it will do, it will just go to the database and everything in the form, it will fill it in nicely. So this is why, how easy Django is to program. We're not going to go through request.post, first name, request.post, add it to this, create that. You know, all of that boilerplate coding that would have taken you half a day. You just form.save. It's done. Then you're going to display a message. A success message and um, you know this is just like I'm used to just always displaying the message and I know in the HTML I'm not showing what the message is I I'll do it in the future tutorials but it's just good practice to always feedback myself and also the users need to know if things worked were, worked out as they expected them to work out so you feedback a success message or an error message if some if things didn't go well and the error message will be displayed if the form is not valid for whatever reason so that's basically all you need to do in your view function. All right. I'm going to le let you do this homework for the same view function. Just replicate this in all your other view functions. All right. Because it, it's going to be exactly the same. And then in the HTML, in the client store, in the HTML, we are going to have to show our form. And I've decided to show it like a modal. All right. Which is really cool. Instead of going to a different uh, HTML page where you're going to now do like a create view right, which is going to be like more coding. I'm just going to have a model that pops up and on the, on the model, we will have the form, right? So if you look at the bottom there, I've added my model there. This is my model. The form starts there instead of the model content. So the form starts there and it ends there, right? This is the model content. Make sure you don't forget your CSRF token, right? And inside of the form, you just do form SP. It's not the best way to display a form, but it's the best we've got. Unless if you want to do things manually, like we did them over there, right? I, a lot of my applications actually end up doing things manually because I just don't like the way the form looks. But in this tutorial, for the sake of learning, it's not important. Form SP will do for now. Form SP, it displays that whole form in as a paragraph over here. That's it. And then you're going to have inside of your form before the close function, uh, bracket of, brackets of the form, you need to have a submit button which says, um, okay, this is not the submit button, this submit button, save changes, this one, right? Then that's it. So the model will open up, that's the form. The form will go to the back end. If it's valid, it will save it. Tush, tush. That's all you gotta do. I'm gonna save all of this, push it to the end. I've already pushed it, I've tested it. So I'm gonna test it with you now. You'll see this is still running. Okay, let's check our server is running over here. It's still running. All right, so let's test our form. Add a new client. Here's the form. You see what I mean by the form it looks ugly. This is form SP. It's the best you got with form SP. Otherwise, you gotta style it manually. And then you've gotta do all the fields manually, like we like we do them here. I tried crispy and crispy is just as bad. Yeah, I tried doing crispy. It's just as bad. So eventually, you know, you might end up doing what we did um for the login form. I think I've shown you how to do that where you show the, in, the you, you're going to manually pick the, uh, the variables one by one there. And um, then you can add your specific styling classes to the forms. All right. And then you can do um, form uh, SP. It, it will be, it will look better with the, with the styling, um, you know, done properly. But for now, this is going to be in, in, enough. We're going to do stock industries. <clears throat> Um, client logo, let's not do anything now. It's not a required field. My address is 700 Rivonia Street. My province is Hauteng. My postal code is 1234. My phone number is 081-234-5678. My email address is um, John uh, Snow. 
at stark industries dot com this is a client and their text number is one two three four five six seven eight nine okay so this is a new client we are adding because later on when you create an invoice we want to associate that invoice to a client so we're going to start by adding let's save that and see there you go now that image disappeared why because the list is no longer empty the list has got something in it and this is the the table list so um everything worked as planned if you added a new one let's add a new one over here um let's add a new company a new fictitious company give me a name there um i don't know um westeros westeros refinery and let's try an, a different address 300 cent turn drive uh province one two three four uh zero eight one two three four one two three four whatever email address who is this also going to be um D D uh danny at uh com. And the text number we'll do it in reverse nine eight seven this that one save changes so this row for is for every time you add a new uh data into your database um the row will increase so it will display as many rows as you um have available so i've shown you enough i think this is enough for one for one sunday and um, there's just a lot to be done for this kind of applications. I really thought I would finish today, but I'm not going to finish today. But I think I've shown you enough and I'll make this code available up to this point where I've coded it. And what you can do is that you can then, as your homework during the week, duplicate what I've done here for products and services and, and take a stab at invoices as well. So that next week when we come back, we have this done for, invo for at least the data input is done. So then we're going to work on the data display where we're going to be able to now display the invoice or email the invoice out, send the invoice out and start tracking stats with the dashboard and all of those other things. Okay. So this is now just the data inputting part of the application. So by next week, when you come back, you've done the data input and then we'll do that. So another thing as well that we'll do next week as when well is pagination, because if you see over here, this is uh, every time you're adding the forms, um, I mean, the rows, it's going to keep adding more. And if you have a hundred rows, you don't want to be displaying a hundred rows like this. So maybe we'll use data tables, which is probably the best to use for this type of application as opposed to Django pagination, because with data tables, you have that nice feature that you can print a table out and, and you can print as PDF and you can like, you know, do all sorts of nice things with data table, search the day, the, the table right there. And then it's got stuff that then you don't have to code in the back end because all of those functionalities of a data table, if you didn't, if they didn't come, uh, you know, standard with the data table, you would have to code them yourself in the back end. And you'd, you'd have to code the search functionality. You'd have to code the printing of the table out as PDF. You'd have to code all of those things. So the data table does it for you and it's a nice summary. So I'll show you that next week. And I'll show you as well how to then uh, maybe delete an invoice, edit an invoice, um, and then you'll have the ability to like click here and see the detail of the invoice and uh, email it out. Okay, we're not at the invoice yet, but imagine we're at the invoice table. All right, email the invoice out to a client, view it, print it out, you know, as a PDF. So we'll do all of that next week and i hope you guys enjoyed i'm looking forward to your comments let me know what you think about the tutorial so far what else you'd like us to cover because i think last week is next week is the last one so if i don't cover anything by next week i'm done with this project and then we're going to move on to the next one so enjoy your week you see you guys again um next week